uh, good, very early morning to people in the West Coast and uh, good evening to the people in Asia and, uh, uh, and Europe. I feel good afternoon to people in Europe. Um, uh, I'm Dr. Rafael Ortiz. I um, uh, have been working at Lenox Hospital since uh, August 2012. I am the Chief of Neuroendovascular Surgery. And today I'm going to be doing a presentation on, on neuroendovascular surgery so that you get familiarized with uh, the specialty. Um, depending on, on which hospital and which uh, country you work at, this might be a specialty by itself, might be a specialty that is part of neurosurgery, might be a specialty part of neurology or a specialty part of radiology. So um, you can imagine that it is a very uh, collaborative uh, field in which uh, we interact with people from all those specialties, at least with those, uh, and there are many other fields, and, and that's, uh, you're going to see in the presentation many of the different conditions that we treat, um, so that you understand how uh, diverse and interesting it can be, because when, when you have interactions with, with other uh, specialists from different fields, obviously uh, you, you have to deal with more collaboration. Uh, you learn from each other, you uh, teach each other, and uh, at the end of the day, the, the patients benefit from these types of, of, of interactions um, in which uh, you have patients that might have uh, something related to the brain or something related to the face or neck or spinal cord. And I'm going to show you uh, examples of all of this. Um, at the end of the day, whatever uh, field in medicine you are part of, it has to, it has to do with partnership and, 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 and working together with others, um, helping each other out so that you can help more patients and their family members. Uh, please ask questions uh, at the end of my presentation. Right now, the chat option is gonna be closed so that we don't get overwhelmed with questions and, and then we cannot finish the presentation. Um, and also at the end, it will be uh, interesting and cool to see where you're all from, as uh, so we know that we have people listening from all over the world. So let me start uh, showing my presentation. Okay, so um, as I told you, I am uh, Rafael Ortiz. Uh, uh, I, I work at Lenox Hill Hospital and also uh, work at other hospitals uh, with, within uh, the system. We have a system of more than 20 hospitals in the New York area. And uh, I collaborate with different uh, teams um, overseeing their quality, uh, their structure, uh, setting it up. Uh, I'm, I'm part of the team that, that works in doing this. And I'm an associate professor of neurosurgery and neurology and radiology for the medical school. Uh, this is my uh, Twitter handle, uh, if you want to follow me, and uh, my LinkedIn, um, in case you want to follow. I post different uh, um, webinars or different uh, presentations that we're gonna be part of as well as uh, every now and then I post something interesting related to uh, our field. Uh, and you can see the different hashtags that we're using uh, just to promote uh, what we're doing with this summer uh, with the students and what we do in our department. So conditions treated, these are some of the conditions that we uh, treat commonly in, in endovascular surgery. Uh, brain aneurysms, which are uh, dilatations of uh, weak spots in arteries uh, in the brain. This can lead to rupture and bleeding in the brain. If that happens, uh, then the, the, there's a, a chance of having significant disability and or dying. Um, the a rule of thumb uh, of every three people that uh, have a bleeding from a brain aneurysm, one dies one ends up with severe disability, and one ends up recovering and going back to a normal life. 
So obviously something very uh, dramatic for patients and family members and for us. Um, that uh, whenever someone arrives with an aneurysm, we need to take it very seriously. Should the patient be treated, yes or no? Uh, that question is important because um, not every aneurysm ruptures. And if someone shows up with symptoms that are unrelated to the aneurysm or the, the aneurysm was found by chance, which happens very commonly, let's say someone had a car accident, they hit their head, they get an MRI and shows an aneurysm. So what to do with that? It has not caused any symptoms, hasn't ruptured yet. It is important to determine who needs treatment because treatments carry risk. And, and people can end up with severe disability from the treatments themselves. So, so we need to outweigh the risks and benefits um, of anyone with an aneurysm. And, and in general terms, if the person is young, if the person is a smoker, if the person has a high blood pressure, if the person has a significant family history of brain aneurysms, and if the aneurysm is large, those are aneurysms that should be treated uh, even if they haven't ruptured to prevent further bleeding in the future. Um, if an aneurysm has bled, though, all of those get treated because if that person survived bleeding from the aneurysm, and I told you before that 33% of them approximately die, uh, so we need to prevent another bleeding from happening. So that's aneurysms. And we work in collaboration with critical care medicine, uh, the entire neurosurgery team, um, nursing, um, is critical for, for, for the management of these patients. Uh, brain and spinal AVMs. Uh, AVMs are abnormal connections between arteries and veins that should not exist. A is, stands for artery, B for veins. Uh, typically, arteries carry blood with pressure. You can feel your pulse in your arteries. Veins don't carry blood with pressure. You can, you can touch your veins and you don't feel a pulse. Reason for that is because in between the arteries and the veins, there are capillaries. And those capillaries dissipate the pressure that is coming from the arteries to the veins. In an AVM, an arteriovenous malformation, there's a direct connection between the artery and the vein that should not be there. And now you have pressure from the artery going directly into the vein that can lead to bleeding. Um, and, and not just bleeding, can lead to other types of symptoms, seizures, headaches, uh, swelling in the spinal cord or swelling in the brain. Um, so these are uh, very challenging uh, uh, problems that uh, we treat. And uh, again, in collaboration with his, uh, neurosurgery, neuroendovascular surgery, neurology, radiation oncology, at least those fields get together to treat uh, these patients. Um, brain tumors, um, I, I know that you have heard uh, some presentations on, on tumors, and uh, we uh, either treat the tumors to embolize them, meaning to close uh, the blood supply to the tumor to make the surgery safer and more effective. That's something we do, let's say, with meningiomas, which are benign uh, um, uh, tumors that are in the surface of the brain, the coverings of the brain, uh, in the meninges. And uh, these uh, tumors, even though they're benign, they can grow, cause uh, swelling in the brain, and they can cause uh, headache and or other uh, neurological symptoms. So we can dry them by embolizing them, and I'll explain what that means, embolization, before taking them uh, to surgery. All of these procedures uh, that we perform are done by navigating a catheter, a long plastic tube, from the femoral artery, the artery that takes blood to the leg, in some cases from the radial artery, the artery that takes blood to the hand, and navigate the catheter inside the arteries of the body, park it in the different arteries of the neck, uh, and from there we inject contrast and take pictures with an x-ray machine. Um, depending on the pathology and the problem that we need to address, we then need to get further into the brain with a smaller catheter that goes all the way into the uh, either aneurysm, AVM, or tumor. And from there, we um, inject something or, or insert something in the problem, in the pathology to prevent bleedings. Um, though that's what an embolization is. And we can use uh, sometimes coils, which are tiny strings of metal made of platinum. We can use uh, a glue, like a medical crazy glue, uh, literally, it, it, this was uh, this has been used since the 1970s 
for, for different problems throughout the body. And the first time that this was done was a very astute doctor that uh, uh, a patient was bleeding, nobody could stop the bleeding, the surgeons couldn't stop the bleeding. And they called these radiologists that knew how to navigate catheters inside arteries to take pictures of the different arteries and veins. And he ran to the hardware store, bought crazy glue and injected it through the catheter. And by doing that, he closed the, the artery that was bleeding and saved the patient. That was done in, a, in, a, in the abdomen. That was the first time ever. And since then, obviously things have evolved. And now uh, we have different types of, of, of glue, of different adhesive or cohesive materials that block arteries or veins uh, throughout the body. And uh, so those are the, the two ways that we usually close uh, uh, or embolize uh, the pathologies in the brain. Sometimes we also use something called uh, particles or embospheres, which are tiny, tiny, tiny pieces of plastic. The measurement of each of them is measuring microns. Um, so we're talking about um, something that measures as small as 50 microns, five zero. Uh, very, very tiny that you cannot see uh, with the eye. We need to mix them with contrast so that we, when we look at the x-ray, we see the contrast going and we know that they were uh, um, in, injecting these tiny particles. We also uh, take care of patients with stroke. Um, and this has been something that has revolutionized our field. Uh, even though uh, the first time that uh, someone with a stroke uh, was treated using catheters inside the body during the vascular surgery was in 1984 in Germany. Um, since then, there have been many, many, many clinical trials and, and many uh, developments of new and improved ways of doing it and new and improved devices. And since 2015, this has been the, the leading force of, behind the field of neuroendovascular surgery in, in building stroke centers uh, to help more people. Uh, before 2015, there were not too many of us, of neuroendovascular surgeons working around the world, uh, but since then it has exploded uh, exponentially because uh, the, there's a clear benefit that if someone that has a blockage of one of the major arteries in the brain um, undergoes a procedure to open the artery and regain blood flow to the brain, that person will regain function. And strokes, if untreated, um, depending on the size of the artery that, uh, that has the problem, approximately 40% of people die. So by opening the artery, you're not just saving the life, but also, uh, these uh, 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 people, uh, we prevent a significant morbidity, significant uh, disabilities, and, uh, and, and imagine the impact not just for them, for their family, for their loved ones, and for the society. Because uh, many of these people are young, they're working regular day-to-day -day individuals. I'm gonna show you a case of this. And we work in collaboration with neurology and rehabilitation to take care of this patient, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. Uh, tumors of the head and neck, we work uh, very closely with the head and neck surgeons at ENT. Uh, there are some tumors that cause uh, bleeding through the nose. Uh, there are some tumors that are cancerous. Uh, there are some tumors that block different arteries in the neck region and that continue to grow and invade the brain. And in order for uh, the entire team to be able to take good care of these patients, we do mapping of the different arteries and veins of the tumor, and we embolize these tumors to make the surgery safer and more effective. Vascular malformations of the head and neck, uh, we do this in adults and kids. Um, these are congenital lesions that are benign. Uh, they're not cancerous. People don't die uh, from these lesions usually. Um, but they can cause bleeding, they can cause uh, disfiguration of the face. Uh, they, the, if it's in the eye, they can cause a blindness. If it's in the tongue region, they can cause obstruction and trouble swallowing and trouble breathing. Uh, if it's uh, anywhere in the, uh, adjacent to the bones of the maxilla, uh, there could be abnormal growth of teeth and bone in a, in a child. So we treat this uh, in conjunction with plastic surgeons, dermatologists, um, uh, and pediatric hematologists. 
uh, carotid disease, we open the arteries uh, of the neck uh, by doing uh, stenting, or, or, and, and that prevents a stroke from happening. And as I mentioned before, nosebleeds, uh, they can happen for many reasons, and if uh, it, it cannot be stopped uh, by external compression, sometimes they need to come um, to the angiography suite, that's our type of OR where do, we do these procedures and navigate a catheter to the arteries that supply the nose and inject either the glue, the coils, or the, or the particles that I mentioned before to prevent bleeding from happening. So to start showing you cases, uh, this is a 29-year-old uh, woman uh, who's an actress in uh, Broadway shows who had a headache and uh, had a transient episode of loss of consciousness. Uh, she went to the emergency room and this little white line here, that is blood. So the headache and loss of consciousness was caused by bleeding in the head. This is a normal color of the brain in a CAT scan, a CT without contrast. And then this is her MRA uh, with contrast that shows this. That's her aneurysm. So that caused this bleeding. And uh, we decided to bring her uh, uh, to angiography suite. You can see here, the, this is the aneurysm. That's a dilatation that should not be there. Arteries are typically like this, like cylinders that are smooth, but there's an, out, a, an outgrowth here coming from this artery. This is the anterior communicating artery that connects right and left side of the brain. In, in this view, this is the left, that's the right side of the brain. This is the left, that's the right side of the brain. These are the left eye. And these, uh, this artery connects right and left side. We took her to the angiogram suite and we did a 3D angiogram. This is to look at the aneurysm in more detail. And so that we can see what's the best angle for us to work at. And you can see here that's a 3D and we can rotate it all the way 360 degrees. And this is the, the this, the position that we chose, and you can see that it's the same as this one, position that we show to treat the aneurysm. We navigated a catheter inside the aneurysm and filled it with the coils, the strings of platinum, and this is how it looks at the end. So now the, the platinum coils are inside the aneurysm. The normal blood flow of the arteries in the normal arteries is good, and there's no a blood going into the aneurysm or contrast, so that means that that patient is protected. She would not have bleeding from this again. She recovered great, and she's back to working uh, and, and, and acting. Uh, she has traveled the world uh, with different uh, productions. <clears throat> um, this is the typical way <clears throat> for us to treat an, an aneurysm. Um, and I'm going to show you an example in video of how we can treat this by using what's called dual microcatheter technique, in which we use uh, two catheters to be able to close the artery. In the bottom right corner, you can see uh, the patient in the angiography suite, and we're going through the leg. That's the catheter that goes uh, uh, through the femoral artery, the artery in the leg, and we're navigating the, the catheter all the way up to the brain. We inject contrast from here. There's an automatic machine that is injecting contrast right now. And we take these pictures. This is looking at the patient from the front. So you can see the left, right side of the skull. And this is looking from the side. And here, uh, this patient's aneurysm is right here. Right here, looking from the side. Her eye is here. Top of the head, back of the head is over here. This is the, what we call the working position, which is the position in which we, have, we can see the aneurysm better. Uh, for us to, to close it in a safe way, because it's not just about closing the aneurysm, it's about uh, at the same time preventing any complications and making sure that the, yes, that the aneurysm is well protected, that the aneurysm is not gonna bleed uh, anytime in the future, but also that uh, the patient doesn't get a complication like a stroke from treating the aneurysm. We measure the aneurysm to know the exact size uh, so that we can choose the type of coil that we need. Coils come in different shapes. Coils come in different sizes uh, of diameter. And, and because the coil is very soft, it's like hair. It's like literally like one hair. Uh, that's how soft it is. And, and we need to choose the appropriate coil to close the aneurysm and prevent any problem. 
Right now, we're going with a tiny, tiny microcatheter, which is a, a catheter that we're gonna put inside the aneurysm. And we use a wire inside, that's called a micro wire. That's me here in the bottom uh, navigating the catheter. The other uh, person standing next to me is Guillermo. I, I know that he had a presentation for you last week. He's a physician assistant. We work together uh, every day. Um, um, and we uh, collaborate in, in all these patients. Uh, so we navigated one catheter inside the aneurysm. And since this aneurysm was a little bit more challenging than the other one, we're gonna use two microcatheters. Reason why this aneurysm is more challenging is because the neck or origin of the aneurysm is wide. And whenever you put uh, something inside a, a, an aneurysm that has a wide neck, it has the tendency of coming out and not staying where you place it. So uh, we need to either use a stent or use a, a, a balloon that we could, could put here to keep the, the coils in place or use two catheters. And that's what we did in this case. Uh, main reason for using two catheters in this case is because when you use a balloon or a stent, you need to give blood thinners uh, to prevent uh, a, a stroke from happening from because a stent or a balloon is a foreign body that is in the normal artery in the brain. Uh, the coils are in the abnormal part of the artery in the aneurysm. So we want them there. But the, the, a balloon or a stent, if it goes in the normal side of the artery, it can uh, cause a stroke because of platelet uh, uh, formation. So those patients need blood thinners and this specific person had bleeding in the brain. So we cannot use blood thinner, otherwise she can bleed more. On top of that, this artery here, this is the other challenge for this case, this artery here uh, is uh, her posterior cerebral artery and that is coming from here, from the uh, origin of the aneurysm. That artery supplies vision um, uh, to this patient, that artery to the right occipital lobe, and this artery also uh, uh, controls uh, or supplies to the territory that controls vision, strength, um, awareness, alertness. Uh, she was born with an anatomical variant in which uh, this artery is coming from the carotid artery. Typically, this artery comes from another artery. We all look different outside. We all look different inside. So that's why experience, uh, training is so critical in this because uh, we need to learn all the different variants that uh, uh, we can encounter, not just uh, to, to be able to treat the patient, but to prevent a complication from happening. I'm gonna do fast forward in this video a little bit so that you can see how uh, we advance a coil. This is at the coil that we're advancing into the aneurysm. And uh, we want it to stay inside the aneurysm. This is the first coil that we're placing for this aneurysm. Sometimes we need to use multiple, usually we need to use multiple coils and depending on the aneurysm, uh, um, that's the number of coils that we need to use. Um, the, the larger aneurysm require more coils. This aneurysm at the end uh, had approximately 13 coils. Um, and we're gonna use one catheter to advance a coil that is gonna be used as a frame, meaning to keep it uh, in the inside the aneurysm and then we're gonna use the, the other catheter to put the other coil. You can see I'm doing fast forward here so that uh, in, so we can save some time, but you can see here how it's taking the shape that we want. Uh, and this is the ideal configuration uh, with this first framing coil. And uh, again, let me move forward so that you can see how it looks at the end. Now we keep putting more and more coils through the other catheter. We can put more and more coils. And at the end of the procedure, this aneurysm is uh, protected, we're taking the catheters out, the little, small micro catheters that, I, that we inserted inside the aneurysm, we're taking them out uh, one by one. And 
now at the end, this is uh, the injection of contrast again showing that the aneurysm is closed, that there's no blood or contrast going into the aneurysm with preservation of the normal artery. That's what we wanted to see. So this was a, a great result. And we check in, in multiple views just to make sure that uh, we didn't cause any trouble at the time of treatment. Other ways of treating aneurysms, and this is a, a newer uh, type of procedure, is uh, called flow diversion. Um, this is a, a six-year-old woman who was found to have this aneurysm incidentally, meaning uh, she was having a headache that was not necessarily associated to the aneurysm. She never had bleeding, and, and she was found to have this. That's the bubble in the weak spot of the artery. That's the aneurysm, and was treated with flow diversion. Flow diversion is a stent or a mesh made of metal, and you can see here under the x-ray, it starts here and ends here. And you can see the mesh that by this type of uh, device was invented in 2009 uh, and, and became uh, a, a real popular way of treating aneurysms uh, approximately in 2012. And uh, what it does is that it, this, the metal in the stent prevents blood from going uh, from the normal artery into the aneurysm and blood from going uh, from the aneurysm into a normal artery. So by doing that, uh, uh, it slows down the blood flow here. And as time goes by in days, weeks, months, uh, sometimes years later, it continues to shrink little by little, little by little, little by little, and the amount of blood that goes in uh, disappears completely. The, it is completely open on both ends so that there is complete normal blood flow around the aneurysm. So this is the beginning and this is six months later. So you can see how it disappears like magic. Uh, it's definitely very exciting uh, development. Sometimes aneurysms are more challenging to treat. Uh, this is a large, uh, what's considered a giant aneurysm of the left middle cerebral artery. It's in the, uh, the, the, you can see the entrance of the aneurysm and the exit of the aneurysm here. This is an aneurysm that if you put coils inside, you're gonna close the exit and you're gonna cause a stroke uh, and have a, a significant complication. It's an aneurysm that by trying to put a stent like the one I showed you before is very challenging because you look at the angle. You need to come this way and then trying to find the, uh, the outflow of the aneurysm and the stents are straight and this is completely, uh, completely twisted. And so we decided, fortunately, we have an amazing team that collaborates, works together uh, in our department. I know you have met uh, Dr. Langer and uh, uh, he's a world renowned expert in bypass surgery. And bypass is really connecting an artery uh, or that goes from elsewhere outside the brain and connecting it with an artery inside the brain. And in this case, um, he did uh, take a, a vein, uh, actually an artery. He took a, an artery that he connected, or an artery from the arm and connected it from an artery that typically goes to the face, the, the face down here and comes like this, like this, like this, and connected it with an artery inside the brain. He put this clip just to increase the demand so that the flow in the, in the bypass remained open. And then after doing that, I went in with a catheter, with another microcatheter, and filled the aneurysm with the coils. And this is how it looks at the end. You can see the normal blood flow to the brain, you can see the aneurysm closed and the bypass supplying the other part. And that patient did great, didn't have any problems of strokes or any uh, complications. As I mentioned to you before, the other uh, problem that we treat uh, is uh, stroke. Um, this is a um, uh, 58 year old history school teacher who uh, developed an episode of uh, vertigo or dizziness, room spinning sensation. He also had some double vision and slurred speech. Um, it's interesting because his student uh, in seventh grade was the one that noticed that he was having symptoms. <clears throat> so she called the, the nurse 
at the school and told her, Mr. So-and-so is having a stroke. The nurse comes, they examine him and they transfer him to our hospital. He received a medication called TPA, which is a clot busting drug that is given uh, intravenously. And we did a CAT scan that showed these little white dots. That's the area of the, of the blockage in the artery. And we did a CAT scan with contrast called a CTA that showed that from here to here, there was not enough blood flow. This is the basilar artery. It's uh, the most important artery in the brain. That artery supplies the brain stem or the switchboard of the brain. If that artery gets occluded, people can uh, have a third level of consciousness, um, can have double vision, can have slurred speech, dizziness, trouble swallowing, and in uh, extreme circumstances, uh, coma and, and death. So this is definitely an emergency. Uh, we took him to the angiography suite. Um, you can see we injected contrast through the right vertebral artery. This is looking at him from the front, so that's the right side, that's the left side. This is looking at him from the side, that's the back, that's the top of the head, his eyes around here. And the blockage is here, the blockage is there. So we navigated uh, something called a solitaire, which is uh, like a stent to open it in, in, in the artery, but it's a stent retriever that we open the stent and then we pull it out and pull the clot out. And this is what came out, this tiny, tiny piece of, of clot. That was what, what was causing the, the blockage. And this at the end. This is, now you can see the blood flow. It was completely blocked here. Now it looks normal with normal flow in the, all the arteries in the back of the brain. He had a great recovery and uh, he actually went back to a normal life. No zero symptoms from this. He only spent two nights in the hospital. That was a, a great save. As I mentioned before, we also treat vascular malformations in the head and neck region in adults and kids. Uh, this is a three-year-old girl uh, who had a sudden onset of pain in her left eye and the left eye was uh, protruding. As you can see, uh, that's uh, called proptosis. Um, had redness in the sclera and she had an MRI that showed, let me show you here, showed this abnormality. This is her brain, the back of the head is here, right eye is here, left eye, nose, and it's easy to compare on an MRI, left and right side of the brain, or left and right eye. So they should look symmetric. In, in this case, you can see that this eye is more, is more anterior, is looking more forward than this one, and that there's a mass occupying a lesion here. That's uh, what's called a lymphatic malformation. And you see two different colors. It's because lymphatic malformations are congenital. People are born with them. They're benign, and they're typically like, they look like this white color. However, the reason why she presented three years after being born with something like this acutely with uh, uh, um, swelling of the eye, redness, is uh, because she had bleeding inside this uh, malformation. The dark uh, area is bleeding. There's a fluid, fluid level. The density of the blood is more than the one of the lymphatic fluid. So that's why she's laying down in a bed so the lymphatic fluid is on top and the, the blood is layering down. This is the same, but looking at her from the front, that's the top of her head, left side, right side, that's her mouth, her nose, and this is the lymphatic malformation, that's her left eye. Uh, these are different views of the same, uh, and also showing that she also has some smaller cysts, not the bigger cyst is the one that uh, is more obvious, but she also has some uh, tiny ones in the bottom and the superior portion. Um, we take it to the angiography suite and we put a needle directly into the malformation. Uh, this is how we do the mapping uh, so that we are accurate and don't put it too deep that can get uh, to the brain or, or, or that we can affect the eye if we do it too lateral to one side or another. Uh, this is how the needle looks going into the malformation and from there we inject a medication called gliomycin. Gliomycin is something that was invented as an antibiotic uh, decades ago. And uh, uh, later it, it, it became a, a popular treatment for uh, cancer. So it's used as a chemotherapy agent. And since 2005, uh, we have been using it 
for this type of problem, for vascular malformations of the head and neck region to prevent uh, uh, cell proliferation growth and also sclerosis it or shrinks it or injures the wall of the cavity of the cyst. So this is after one treatment. Her eye became, uh, uh, the swelling went away, but you can see that the eye is looking down while this one is looking forward. It's because you have that other smaller cyst that I showed before that is still there. You can see it here, you can see it here. It is towards the uh, upper part of the orbit and that's why the eye is looking down. So we did a second treatment and this is her after two treatments. So she went back to uh, complete normal growth and she's doing great till today. This is another similar example of a young boy that presented with uh, swelling in the right eye compared to the left. This is MRI. Again, the right eye is more anterior than the left. And you can see here the cyst uh, or lymphatic malformation with the fluid fluid level. We did uh, two treatments uh, also for him. Uh, one that had 4.5 milligrams, another one three milligrams. This is follow up MRI and this is him. We like to do, uh, we prefer to do multiple treatments and then doing everything at once. This is not cancer. So, so when, uh, when you operate for cancer, you need to take it out, otherwise the person can die uh, from the problem. In lymphatic malformation, these are benign problems. So we can do it in stages, take our time, and do it safely. If we do too much, we can hurt someone. If we do it slowly in different stages, uh, uh, we definitely can have the, uh, help someone have the impact that we desire and prevent any complications. Or oh, talking about uh, vascular malformations, uh, sometimes we deal with vascular malformations of this uh, that in, of the spinal canal. Uh, this is uh, an MRI of someone that uh, presented with uh, weakness in uh, her arms and legs, as well as neck pain. And uh, this is uh, her brain is up here. This is the cerebellum, the uh, back bottom portion of the brain. The brainstem is here. This is the cervical spinal cord, and then the thoracic spinal cord. And this white area here is swelling inside the spinal cord caused by congestion of drainage of blood. These are veins that are congested because she has an abnormal connection between arteries and veins, similar to what I uh, mentioned before that can happen inside the brain can also happen uh, elsewhere in the body. And in this case, it is this artery, you can see the origin here, is connected to a vein that drains the spinal cord and drains upward into the brain. This vein is going up into the brain. These are her arteries, the brain showing that they're, they're completely normal, completely normal in the left side as well. But this is the problem. And, and this is the, abnormal connection between artery and vein is here. And this is all abnormal drainage of vein that goes all the way into the brain. The most important uh, line that we're seeing in these two pictures is this tiny, 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 skinny, 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 skinny line. That's the anterior spinal artery. That's the artery that supplies uh, the spinal cord. This is an abnormal connection of artery and vein that shouldn't exist. This is normal. That's an artery that uh, supplies the spinal cord. So if this artery gets blocked over here, there can be a, a, a irreversible blockage of the artery and an irreversible stroke of the spinal cord. And because of this location that is in the neck, anything from the neck down could get affected and paralyzed. So that's a very stressful uh, situation for us to deal with. However, we were able to do an injection of glue, of NBCA. Uh, we mix it with something called ethylol, uh, which is uh, an alcohol that makes it thicker and uh, uh, you can see it better under, actually you can see it under x-ray. If you only inject the glue, you're not going to be able to see it. So at the end, uh, we were able to close that abnormal connection. This is a normal uh, anterior spinal artery that is preserved, and she had great recovery. This is a follow-up MRI 
showing uh, resolution of the swelling. Uh, sometimes we have a very, very challenging, interesting cases. Uh, this is a 33-year-old uh, uh, dentist who um, had a headache and uh, was found to have this. And uh, this is an abnormal connection between artery and vein that should not exist. And again, an ABM that has a dilated um, pouch, like a vein, looks like an aneurysm, but this is more uh, an ABM with an aneurysm that appears to be in the venous side, and this is a vein draining. You're not supposed to see arteries and veins in the same picture. When you inject contrast, you see arteries, then the capillaries, and then the veins. But when you see arteries and veins in the same picture, it means that there's an AV malformation. Uh, there, there's a connection without capillaries in between, what we were describing before. And um, Dr. Langer and myself uh, worked together in this case. This is doing the mapping of the AVM. Uh, it was not a safe uh, embolization for us to do through the artery, which is where, where I have been describing all our procedures uh, so far. Uh, because if we injected the glue or put the coils or do anything to close these uh, arteries, we're gonna cause a stroke, it is normal. This, this tiny blush uh, with a gray background, uh, this is normal blood parenchyma. So we had to go through the vein to be able to close these uh, abnormal, this is a, a long uh, microcatheter the, we went from the left to the right side. We are, and we injected this medical crazy glue, NBCA. So this at the end, you can see that the AVM is closed and you don't see the aneurysm anymore. And this looking from the front again, the right side is here. That's where the AVM was. And as you have heard in previous presentations, we also take care of uh, uh, people with brain tumors, this is uh, GBM or stage four uh, uh, cancer. This is malignant, people die uh, from this type of cancer. Uh, actually, if someone gets diagnosed from after having some symptoms and they do not have any treatment for this, uh, they die within six months after being diagnosed. So uh, there are many efforts to try to cure this type of cancer. Until today, this is incurable. Uh, people die from this at some point. And, and we are part of a big effort of doing clinical trials to, uh, in an attempt to prolong life. Uh, hopefully cancer can be cured, this type of cancer can be cured at some point, but right now it's trying to prolong life with minimal uh, side effects with a good quality of life. Um, this, is, uh, uh, this is a tumor, that's a GBM, glioblastoma multiforme. Uh, it crosses from right side of the brain, this is the midline, into the left, so both sides are affected. This is a type of tumor that um, surgery for it is, it could be devastating because uh, it's in a deep portion of the brain and, and, and the person can end up with severe problems uh, if you try to take it out completely. Um, so in someone that we know that uh, has a high uh, likelihood of mortality in the upcoming months or years, we don't want to cause damage to them. So, so instead of going for a resection of the uh, tumor, went for a combination of radiation, uh, chemotherapy, as well as uh, endovascular treatment in which we navigate a catheter, go to the arteries that supply the tumor. This is a tumor in a CAT scan that we do during the angiography. The tumor is like this, this is this whole thing here. So we inject it on both sides. And after multiple treatment, you can see how the tumor is much smaller. It's still there, but much smaller than this. So the patient is doing much better clinically. And I'm gonna show you one last case uh, before we finish. Uh, so that you can see how diverse and interesting uh, our specialty is. Um, um, I have shown you great cases and because of that, uh, I was able to take care of this patient. This is a 12 year old uh, that had a pulsating swelling in the submandibular area here uh, with a brew, you can hear pulsations. And uh, um, it was first noticed a year 
uh, and a half prior to presentation, but then he became very lethargic uh, and uh, sleepy and, and had trouble walking, had ataxia in balance. This is uh, what his uh, ADM looks like. This is uh, the catheter, we inject the contrast. This is the, the nidus or the abnormal connections between arteries and veins. This is the big vein. Again, like I told you before, you shouldn't see an artery on a vein in the same picture, these arteries. And this is his uh, MRI and MRA. Uh, this is the AVM. This is the abnormal connection that you see on the MRI. Uh, and for most uh, uh, neurosurgeons or endovascular surgeons, uh, this would be extremely rare to see this type of, of picture. And even for me, so I had to go back and read a little bit about uh, anatomy for this patient and the blood supply to the head in this patient. This is the patient. Uh, it is, um, his name is Monty. Um, and you can see there is the owner sent us pictures of how uh, sleepy and sad and he didn't want to eat. And uh, he was, uh, whenever he walked, he had a lot of trouble uh, walking. Uh, and it was, uh, and, uh, and they found this ABM. Um, he looked for different uh, specialists that take care of this type of problem. And in the animal hospital in Manhattan, uh, we have uh, one of the world experts in, in abnormal connections of arteries and veins in dogs and, and cats. Um, and, uh, but he, he doesn't have too much experience in, in dealing with brain, head and neck. So that's how I got involved. Uh, he, uh, called us and uh, we went to help him with this problem. This uh, uh, Monty, when he's intubated, just getting ready for the procedure, uh, you can see the pulsations of the AVM. And this is a team. There were a lot of us working on Monty. Uh, that's me here doing the procedure. This is the, the famous uh, interventional radiologist, this is Dr. Rosen. He's a human interventional radiologist, he's Guillermo, a uh, physician assistant uh, that you met before. This is a, a neurosurgery, uh, a veterinary neurosurgery resident. Um, and at the end of the procedure, uh, you can see from, from before to after, we were able to decrease the flow by injecting this uh, called onyx, which is like a glue to close the connection between arteries and veins. This is Monty in the ICU. He's Monty back at home. And the owner was extremely uh, gracious and happy uh, with the result and sent uh, this gift, uh, just uh, thanking us for, for, for taking care uh, of his precious uh, dog. So at the end of the day, it's about the team, it's about working together, it's about collaborating. Um, you have seen some of these pictures already. Uh, this is myself uh, working with uh, Dr. Langer and Guillermo in the angiography suite. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of our newest partners, uh, Dr. Jaffel Cerule, who did a presentation last week. I don't know if any of you were part of it with Dr. Langer and myself in a retreat that we had for our department last year. And this was uh, the, the core five of, of our department uh, in the operating room and in I know Dr. Langer showed this picture last week in one of his presentations, uh, simulating Abbey Road from the Beatles you know, on Park Avenue. Um, we are uh, extremely fortunate uh, to do what we do for a living and, uh, and even more fortunate to uh, work with each other uh, because it's uh, uh, extremely rare that we can um, find people with uh, similar goals in life, similar morals, ethics, uh, uh, that uh, we can uh, become friends with, that we can trust each other, that we can respect tremendously as a uh, doctor, uh, physician, surgeon, and human being. Um, it is a family, um, and for all of you uh, as an advice, in, uh, as you grow uh, through uh, the different stages of uh, high school, college, uh, medical school, residency, fellowship, it is uh, critical to find those relationships that are uh, unique 
and uh, cherish them, foster them, work on them. So that uh, when at the end of the day, uh, yes, you will be able to take a better care of patients. Yes, you will be able to have a better impact on, on, on the families of the patients you take care of. But, but you will also have a more balanced life, a great uh, relationship at work with people helps having a great relationship with the loved ones at home. So uh, I would like to open this for questions. Uh, and uh, Josh, if we can uh, open. I have a question. Yes. So um, why did you choose to do this, bro? Why did you become an interventionalist? So the uh, multiple reasons, but, but at the end of the day, I'm going to tell you my, my, my path to where I'm at today so that people understand it better. I, uh, I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to uh, go to medical school. I knew that I wanted to be a doctor. I didn't know uh, initially what specialty, although I thought I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon because I uh, love uh, uh, sports. And uh, when I went to medical school, it wasn't my passion. Uh, orthopedic surgery was not my favorite field. Um, what I did enjoy a lot was uh, neuroanatomy and uh, neurology uh, in medical school. So I went to do a, a, a residency in neurology at Thomas Jefferson University uh, uh, in Philadelphia. I'm originally from Puerto Rico. I did my medical school in Puerto Rico. Uh, when I uh, arrived uh, to Philadelphia, I realized that uh, even though neurology was a beautiful field, um, I wanted to be able to have a more impact in the uh, emergency treatment of, of patients. Um, and, and I discovered, fortunately, I had a, a, a great a leader of the field in, our, in my hospital, Dr. Robert Rosenwasser, who I learned from about the field of neuroendovascular surgery. I saw that the way that he could uh, treat a brain aneurysm, cure a brain aneurysm, uh, the way that the team could cure a stroke and, uh, and, and avoid uh, death or significant morbidity. And I said, this what I want to do. This is my passion. I, uh, I, I want to be able to have a, 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 an impact on patients in which um, I feel great at the end of the day. And I, that patient and the family members, not only the patient survives, but have a direct impact on, on their families and their loved ones. Um, this is a field, I mentioned this uh, before at the beginning of the presentation, in which there's a lot of diversity in the, in the sense that you interact with neurosurgery, neurology, vascular surgery, cardiology, radiology, uh, plastic surgeons, dermatologists, pediatricians, ENT. Um, uh, so it's very interesting. And you have a, a great balance between outpatient uh, uh, office uh, environment, procedural environment, and ICU care. So th there is a, a great uh, interaction between all the different areas. I'll let you get to your questions, but I just wanted to point out that this is the for, the, for the audience, that the future of neurosurgery is really defined by the stuff Rafa does, that a lot of the open procedures and the big operations are going away in, in favor of less invasive, catheter-based robotics, radiation treatments, uh, not, in the, you know, small devices. So, Rafa really represents the future of our business. And uh, if you're thinking about doing anything like this, that you always think what's going to happen in the next generation, not the past, because everything's going to change in your lifetime. So Rafa, there's about 100 questions there for you, so go for okay. it. Uh, what is the difference between the procedure to pull a blood clot while taking an aneurysm out with a catheter? The blood clot is um, called mechanical thrombectomy. That's for strokes. An aneurysm, we do not take it out with a catheter. We close it. Uh, by inserting something into the aneurysm or the normal artery. Uh, Dr. Ortiz, is bleomycin is a drug used in chemotherapy. Is it possible that it kills healthy cells and cause damage when used to treat malformation? The answer is yes. 
And that's the reason why uh, we, this after many uh, studies and trials, that we limit the dose that we can use for bleomycin. We know that uh, the, this medication, if, if injected in more than 300 milligrams in a lifetime, can cause, some, can cause something called pulmonary fibrosis, affect the lungs, that's the side effect that this drug has. We limit it to at most 15, one five milligrams per treatment. So even if the person has 20 treatments, uh, will be below the threshold. Dr. Uh, what is the cause of anterior spinal artery blockage, ABM in the spine? Is it congenital? How is MBC thyroid injected? Do you directly inject the spinal fluid? Uh, we go inside the arteries, so it's not a direct visualization of the spinal cord or spinal canal. We're only working inside the arteries, and we inject uh, at the end of the microcatheter, we mix the thyroid and MBC, and we inject it uh, looking on their x-ray to see where the, the glue is going. We want it to go to the connection between artery and vein. We don't want it to go into the vein by itself. We, we don't, because it can cause bleeding if it blows the outflow with blood going in. And we don't want it to go into a normal artery or it can cause the stroke. That's how a stroke can happen with embolization. Hey, Ralph, there's a question further down that I think is an important one, particularly yeah. who you are about any challenges that you face being Latino, that there weren't, that there aren't a lot of Latino doctors and, and whether there were obstacles or difficulties that you in particular face, I think that's an important thing to address for this audience. The question is being Latino, did you face any adversity? Do you have any advice for other minorities want to pursue medicine, especially since there are not many of us? That's way down the list, but okay. I just saw that. Okay, so, so, the the answer to this i found it here jocelyn hernandez yeah um um thank you for your question jocelyn and the it's, it's like anything in life we obviously you have a your own way of growing up uh whatever your parents have taught you in life whatever your circumstances have been in life that's how you're ready to deal with uh, adversity or challenges uh in the future um, me personally, have a, I, I grew up always uh, being very secure of myself, very proud of who I am in every way, as a man, as a son, as a husband, as a Puerto Rican, as a Latino, as a doctor, as a neuroendovascular surgeon. Very proud of who I am, and uh, even though there might be some instances in which there are challenges or perceptions of others thinking of a particular way about Latinos, uh, just by being myself and, and being the best that I can be in anything I do, uh, and specifically about medicine, uh, studying hard, showing that, uh, that not only I can compete, that I can be better, that, that, that other people in, in trying to get the same position. I'm gonna tell a story. I, I arrived to uh, Jefferson University Hospital to do a rotation as a medical student and coming from Puerto Rico. And obviously I, I wanted to be ready. I didn't wanna be disappointed at the end of the rotation. And the, the first week I, uh, there was a chairman's round, which was the, the chairman of neurology, Elliot Mankel, he had all these visiting students uh, in a round table, and one of the students was presenting a case, um, and then he would ask the student to stop the presentation to ask questions. And the first question came to me, and, and I answered the question. And uh, it was like 12 of us on the table, and everybody was from Ivy League schools, um, everyone was from Jefferson, Penn, Harvard, Brown, uh, I was the only Latino. There were no black students in the room. And the, he, he tells the student after I, I answer, okay, continue your presentation. He continues, then he asked the student next to me another question, he couldn't answer it. He asked the, the third student, he couldn't answer it, the fourth, fifth, sixth. he went around the, the table and it gets to me and I answer it. So the, the, he said, continue the presentation. That happened three times. That event gave me a reassurance that I was doing the right thing, that regardless of the environment I was gonna be put in, I was gonna be able to be successful forever in my life. 
And um, obviously, the, the, and the story, uh, the, 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 the teaching about this is be ready. And in these stages, study, study, study hard. Study, study. When people are sleeping, you're studying. Athletes think, the, think this way. When uh, uh, Floyd Mayweather, uh, world-renowned boxer, when he trains at 2 in the morning and at 3 in the morning. Why? Because he says, well, my opponent is sleeping. I'm going to be training. And this is uh, the same for everything in life. Study, study, study. It gave me a lot of security. Uh, so regardless of any comments that people make, any assumptions about you know, the race or nationality, uh, country you're coming from, accent, uh, or anything like that, if you show that you're the most competent person in the room, you're going to win. Okay. Thank you so much. I think we're going to have to cut you off here, though. Okay. So I hope you guys enjoyed. Um,